people. Uh, thank you for, for joining and those online, thank you for, for joining um, this session. So this is, it's, it's following the, the session in the same room this morning on, uh, it was titled The Demand Needs, Needs Supply, uh, looking at the, the revisiting of the AgriMass uh, study by Litzenberg and, and Schneider. Uh, that Aaron Johnson was, uh, is putting together, leading or co-leading with a fine group of, of, of folks. Um, and we learned a lot in the, in the morning session and this session is meant to, to follow up on that. So how, how do we respond in the academy from what, from what we're learning and how we've looked at that? So we have three presentations uh, to, in this session. Uh, I've, I've mentioned to the presenters will We'll have about 15 to 20 minutes of presentation. So that'll take us to the, the top of the hour or the two o'clock hour. And then uh, we have Jason Berthold who's kindly agreed to serve as our discussant. So we'll have a, a 30 minute or more discussion on that depending on how quickly our presentations go through. So that's the, that's the agenda for that. And I don't wanna take any more time. So I'll hand it off to Yulia who's gonna talk about human capital needs in lending. Julia, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I wish I was there in person, but we'll do this online this time. Uh, so I will talk about human capital needs in agricultural lending. And just before I get started, a uh, quick disclaimer. So this was a small pilot study, as I see it. Um, where I went and I gathered some information to understand what, what lenders, different lenders are looking for in their workforce today and what they will be looking for 10 to 15 years down the road, um, potentially. And then I hope that this will lead into a larger project where we'll replicate it nationwide. And then because it is a small um, interview, executive interview based study, we cannot generalize anything. So I just wanted to keep that in mind before we proceed. Okay, so the motivation for this study, um, if you look at, if we look at agricultural credit markets, um, we've seen a lot of changes in the last five to 10 years, 10 to 15 years, uh, we see a lot of non-traditional lenders coming in. So those would be um, agricultural lenders that, you know, are regulated differently, that they source funds differently, they heavily utilize data um, and rely on data analytics. And so, as they come in, the question is, are they needing different kinds of employees and skill sets, right? And then another big uh, change is the technology adoption. The heavier they rely on data, the heavier they have to rely more, they have to utilize technology. And so again, that brings another question, should we be equipping our students with more coding, programming skills, um, even for, um, uh, for ag finance uh, majors? There has been some anecdotal evidence also that suggests that ag lenders high, started hiring more and more employees from um, college graduates and particularly from business programs, um, whether it's finance or just pure business, but not necessarily ag business or ag, ag econ. And that makes some of us probably a little curious, if, is this really happening? And if so, why? Uh, and so finally, the motiv my motivation was really to um, gather some data so that I can or get some insights, I guess, in this case, uh, get some insights so that they, that can help me inform my curriculum development and some changes in curriculum and also better advise our students. Um, relevance, again, is going to help. The insights will help um, academic educators in ag finance and ag business to adapt our curriculum, but also think about how we can advise and prepare students better for these evolving needs in the sector. The objectives technically are three big objectives, or one big overall objective is to better understand human capital needs of agricultural lenders, given that we know that they are becoming more diverse, the lenders themselves, right? And so I focused on three kind of big pillars current recruitment strategies. So uh, how are they recruiting their employees now? Uh, currently demand, demanded comp competencies. So what skill set they are looking for right now? And then in the future, what are, what are, what are they, they are expecting? What opportunities and challenges when it comes to um, recruiting and retaining 
human capital. So I used executive in-depth executive interview approach to gather data. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit to analyze the data. I used a case study approach. Um, here is my protocol number. Three subjects I interviewed in this um, study. And that's why I said it's a very small scale. Um, so three subjects I interviewed and those subjects represented three different types of lenders. And I, I will explain that in a little bit and sizes of lend agricultural lenders. And they all are agricultural lenders. Um, all subjects held executive positions. So whether they're president and senior VP, um, they were not necessarily directly involved in hiring process, but um, they were on a strategic planning, kind of on the strategic aspect of the organization. They actively um, were engaged in human capital acquisition and, and things like that. So they are familiar with these um, issues. And then the interview lasted about a little over an hour. A couple of them were via Zoom and some of them were in person. As for the instrument, I had 15, it has 15 open-ended questions um, covering kind of four major categories. And four major categories were a little bit about company's background, about the um, interview, the subject in being interviewed himself, themselves. Um, second, correct, uh, that was recruitment strategies that they're currently employing in the company. Um, I did ask several questions about currently demanded skill set or competencies, and then uh, human capital opportunities and challenges. So kind of mimicking the objectives of the study. So I'll jump into the results. Let me just check how I'm doing on time here. Okay, so I, um, I'll jump into the results. And again, because it's a case study, it's really hard to, I find it kind of difficult to present the results, not in a paper, but um, in a presentation. So bear with me. Um, I'll try to make it um, as explicit or simple as, as I can. So three companies interviewed. One, um, two of the three companies were uh, traditional lenders. Okay, and I make a distinction because I always, I kind of want to see if their human capital needs are different from non-traditional lenders. So that's kind of a something in the back burner that I'm trying to remember as I go through this. So two traditional lenders um, and one non-traditional lender. Um, in terms of size, we interviewed one community bank that was the smallest, uh, one FCS, Farm Credit Association, the largest out of the three, and the non-traditional lender was a real estate lender and they were the second largest um, closer. It was in terms of their portfolio, they were closer to FCS rather than the community bank. Far away actually from the community bank. Uh, in terms of geographic footprint, um, community bank, small local bank, regional, five locations across the state, FCS, um, regional, and then non-traditional national, they have, uh, they, they deliver their credit program products um, uh, across 47 states, I believe. In terms of the size as number of employees they hire, again, you see significant differences. Um, community bank is the smallest, roughly about 49 people. Uh, FCS, the largest, 1,350, and then non-traditional was 60, hires about 60 um, people. Most, all of them, of the individuals I interviewed had uh, senior executive positions and all of them have been with the company for over 23 years. I did also ask them about their exposure to agriculture, how long they worked in ag, and that was over 25 years for all of them. So that's just to give you an idea of who I interviewed. So now let's go a little bit into um, recruitment strategies. So first I asked them, I guess the table, um, in the table on the left-hand side column, you can see the questions I asked and across, um, you can see the responses kind of summary and it's a lot of information, but again, because it's a qualitative information, it's harder to, to deliver it visually. Um, but I'll walk you through and just highlight the most important things. So first I asked, where do they hire their employees? Do they hire them straight from school? Um, do they hire them from competitors? 
or do they groom them internally? So that's how I kind of framed the question. And what we see, it really, first that it depends on the positions. Some positions, they specifically hire from competitors, whereas other positions, they um, you know, advertise broadly. Um, the other thing that uh, was interesting is that we found differences. I found differences across three types of these lenders. So as you see, community bank, majority, and it's a small community bank, majority of their positions fall under, you know, bookkeepers and tellers. And so they recruit those from general population. They don't necessarily recruit them specifically from colleges. They don't go to their career fairs. Okay. And then a lot that 1% of the loan officers position that they hire, they groom them internally. So that's where they, they grow them. They start from a teller and they grow them all the way to um, the loan officer. So that's how they approach the larger um, bank uh, lenders that I've interviewed, they approached it differently. Um, the general positions like administrative, accounting, marketing, um, they hire a lot of them from college. Okay, so about this, for example, this non-traditional lender, 40% from college, 60% externally or promoted um, internally. An interesting fact that came up from this non-traditional lender is that um, when it comes to sales position, they um, they try to hire them from competitors, right? Because again, if you think about geographic span, if they offer products across the nation, they need an individual to step in with their customer list, so to say. And so they hire them from um, that area and from competitors most of the time. Uh, the second question I asked them in this category is, um, when, it look, when you look at recruiting from college, college graduates straight from, from, from the college, what are the factors that kind of drive your decision? Where do you go? What schools you go to to recruit? And um, community banks, they don't really recruit from specific schools. They either advertise it broadly, so that was not really applicable to them, but at least to the one that I interviewed. Um, but the larger ones, non-traditional and uh, farm credits um, association, with them, again, um, depends on the position. So if we are talking about financial officer or loan officer, just different terminology here, insurance officer positions, for them, they recruit those they recruit from, um, particularly for farm credit. A lot of them, they recruit from schools. And so in that case, they would look at location, reputation of the program and relationship with faculty. And because those are the individuals who will work closer with their clients, right? Whereas marketing or accounting, they're not, they're gonna be a little more remote away from the clients. So they don't necessarily, you know, work as closely with those. And so similarly, we see for non-traditional lenders, they look at personal connections, reputation of the program, and they kind of mentioned that reputation of the program, they view it as a function of the rigor and, and the faculty. So as we faculty think about um, building those, we need to think to be thinking about uh, building relationships with those companies or continue maintaining relationships because they do mention that relationship with faculty matters when it comes to recruitment, recruiting. Geographic footprint based on the size, again, because of the size, the community banks locally um, um, recruit the non-traditional, uh, the farm credit regionally and non-traditional nationally. And then an interesting question I asked, um, we've heard this avid anecdotal evidence that more and more, more often we see them lenders, agricultural lenders hiring from business programs rather than or finance, rather than ag business or ag finance. And so um, for the community bank, what we've seen is when it comes to positions like bookkeepers and tellers, again, they generate, they um, put a broad kind of post and they hire from general population, not necessarily schools, but they don't really have a preference. They said it's 50-50. For loan officers, they primarily try to recruit from ag programs. When it comes to larger um, lenders, farm credit and non-traditional in this case, with them, again, positions that will individuals, will, where individual employees will work close with farmers. So that would be your loan officer, financial officer, insurance officer, 
um, even credit analysts, underwriters, sales, they will come, they try to um, hire them from ag programs if they come from ag programs. General, like accounting, um, they uh, marketing, um, they come from, they can come from business, general business programs. Um, Farm Credit also talked about data and analytics as they are growing that area. Those employees will not, you know, they don't necessarily have to come from ag business, right? They are looking uh, to source those employees from IT and data science fields, of course, not ag business. So again, that's just something to remember. I think for me, again, it's not a, um, it's not a representative sample, but these insights make me think that yes, the le agricultural lenders are recruiting more from business and finance programs and data science, but they're recruiting a different kind of employees, not, not, not your typical employee that would come from ag program. <clears throat> so then the next set of question we asked was a currently demanded, demanded skill set or competencies. We asked them, you gave, I, I gave them, I believe eight or nine different area competency areas and asked them to rank from the most important to the least important. And one thing that st stands out is that the ag background and communication came across all three lenders as the top one the, in the top three um, competency areas. So that still matters a lot, ag background and communication. Interestingly, the larger banks, and here I made a mistake, character should have been number one here too. Um, the larger lenders responded identically and they ranked them as character number one, ag background number two and communication number three. And the reason why they put at character number one, um, which I thought was interesting is because of the data, how much data they handle and um, confidentiality um, issues. With the community bank, they um, similar similar kind of findings, but they also um, appreciated prior employment background, employment and um, business and economics kind of background. And then I asked them, okay, can you talk a little bit about what do you mean when you say ag background? Um, so in those in those your top three competency areas, talk a little bit about what really matters in those. And so if you look at um, larger lenders, when it comes to the background, agricultural background that they value and that they are looking for, again, not necessarily for every, ideally they would want everyone to have it, but agricultural background, they want um, specifically for employees who will work closely with farmers, producers. So that would be um, financial officers, insurance officers, or loan officers. Uh, credit, underwriting, etc., sales. Um, and for them, agricultural background, they define not someone who lives in the rural area, or, but someone who has direct involvement and understanding of production agriculture, which is kind of different because for community bank, for them, it was just exposure to agriculture. So as long as you um, lived around it and you can have a basic understanding for the larger lenders, they want, for those specific positions, they want them to understand agriculture, not just be, um, you know, be exposed to it. And so the last set of questions I asked, is your organization doing upskilling or reskilling? So in other words, upskilling, improving your skills within a certain position or position or reskilling, meaning um, acquiring completely new set of skill set. So pretty much um, grooming you for another job within the same organization. And what we found is that um, both upskilling and reskilling is costly and time consuming for them. And so the larger ones um, say that, all of them said that they do a little bit of um, some upskilling, so improving employees' skills within their jobs. When it comes to reskilling, for larger ones, what they believe is particularly in data analytics, the gap between what their employees currently, the current employees have and what they will need in the next five years is so large that it will be too expensive and difficult to kind of train them into those new jobs, right? And so for them to acquire those extra analytical skills. And so for them, it's cheaper to 
uh, cheaper and probably more effective and faster to go ahead and hire someone um, outside. And so they don't do a lot of reskilling. Uh, with the community bank, they do with the loan officers in particular because again of their different business model and different size. When they found for loan officer position, for example, if they find the right person who is willing to stay in that small location, they are gonna do the reskilling, meaning move them along the line for as long as they can. Uh, what positions will experience a higher demand? Um, smaller uh, community bank thought the sales, um, there will be more demand for sales position in ag uh, lending and less for loan processors. When it comes to larger banks, definitely data analytics and business technology. And um, how will the skill set change? Again, larger banks talked about more robotics, AI, data analytics, and application of insights. So they maybe not every employee in their organization needs to know data analytics, but financial officer, loan officer, credit um, folks, they need to understand how to apply those insights from the data scientists into their um, and incorporate into their advising. And so the conclusion is really is that recruitment strategies differ across all three types of lenders and their sizes. Um, it's important to keep kind of relationship with um, lenders if we try to build the finance, agricultural finance program because they do look, look at that, they do utilize that relationship uh, with faculty. And so that's important. Um, still need to remember that while technical skills are important, ag background, character and communication kind of top the list um, for all three of them. And again, when we think about, ag, I guess my biggest takeaway is when we think about agricultural credit uh, markets and the employers in that sector, we need to remember that it's not a very homogenous group. It's, they are very diverse and so their needs are different. And so um, they rely, the, the, the large lenders rely more on technology and data, but, and they do, they do hire more from business and finance school, but we need to remember that maybe, and again, look more into that to support to see the data would support this, these findings that I found. Um, but if they are supported, then we would definitely um, need to remember that if we are preparing students to go into the financial officer's position to work for these large companies, they don't necessarily need to know how to code in Python, but they do need to know how to use the insights from the data scientists to do their job. Um, and then another, another interesting point, they said that they are hoping that we will be teaching them how to use the uh, leverage remote technologies. So again, the larger lenders are hoping that more things will be shifted online and done uh, remotely. And as the last item, as um, consumer profile is changing, so they're anticipating to, again, have more consolidation, more retirement in the sector. Um, so if we're going to have more and more larger farmers and very small farmers and the middle part will be shrinking, um, they are thinking that particularly loan officer position, the way they think about and frame them, they will be different. They will look different in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, those who would be serving the large farmers, their job descriptions would look different from a financial officer or loan officer who will be serving maybe small, inter you know, startups in agriculture or small uh, hobby farms and so they use the terminology like entrepreneurial coaching versus business consultants for large businesses large agriculture businesses so that's all i have um we'll be glad to take any questions you want to do questions or save it for the after uh however actually a moderator wants whatever is more let's, convenient let's set. Let's save the questions uh, for after, Yulia. Okay. Thank you, Thank you so it. much. Uh -huh. well, I have to figure out how to get my slides up on Zoom. Yeah. That was a mistake. Close that.
Can you folks on Zoom see my slides? Yes. All right. Thank, great. So what I'm going to talk about, so I'm Eric Michaels. I'm from the University of Saskatchewan. And what I'm going to share with, uh, with the folks here and on Zoom is uh, one of these responses, uh, kind of the call from the, the, the title of, of the session of, of how then shall we teach, you know, responding from what we've heard this morning, what we just heard from, from Yulia on what are the needs of industry and how do we as the, the academy uh, respond to that? And what I wanna do is uh, just provide uh, maybe an introduction, maybe, a, uh, maybe just a refresh uh, of this idea of a, uh, a micro-credential. And this is something that's uh, kind of coming up in, in discussion in, at my institution at the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. Uh, we've seen more and more of this uh, across um, other institutions across Canada of, of uh, departments, programs, schools developing these more bite-sized uh, components of what we would offer in a, in a traditional uh, course, but can you offer this in, a, in an upskilling, reskilling framework? So that not a 39-hour, 42-hour, how many hours your your typical course is, but can you do this in a, a smaller chunk that may be uh, more acceptable for, for a different audience. So I'll, I'll do a bit of a, a refresh uh, and, and in an introduction. So again, going like Aaron did in the earlier session, I think this all really starts with uh, Litzenberg and, and Schneider's work in this. And, and uh, you know, in the, the industry has long uh, looked for this range of of technical skills plus these essential skills or soft skills. You know, what are the, uh, what are the things that really set uh, applicants apart or um, early career professionals apart from, from others? And, um, you know, from some of these uh, quotes here, I pulled from, from uh, that work uh, from Litzenberg or Schneider say, you know, data show that general categories of interpersonal characteristics and communications are, the most important followed by business and economics. And Yulia just kind of flipped that on us and said, well, you know, you farm manage or uh, uh, a farm background is, is really important in that particular area. And in Litzenberg, if you look at Litzenberg's uh, work, that was actually lower, you know, that was viewed quite low. And again, some of that, Again, we, we talked about this this morning. Is that because of how that question was asked? Is that most of the, the applicants possess that? So we're not gonna rate, rate that high because it's, it's, in, it's already present. So, we, you know, so I've, I've had questions just for myself. Is it a, a gap analysis or you know, that's needed, but it's provided. So I'm not gonna rate that as important. I don't know. The other thing I, I thought about was when that survey went out, it, what was the ordering of the questions? I'm assuming that was a paper survey where you're not gonna randomize the order as Aaron may have done in the, in the online version with the program. You, you get these in a, in a random order and ranking that. And, and also asking somebody to rank one to 76, good grief. Um, uh, I don't think we would punish uh, respondents in the way that, that Let's did in the in the eighties, uh, but again, uh, interpersonal characteristics, communication skills rank really high. Continue to rank really high. And I this this quote from Litzenberg, uh, I thought really stood out. It, it's um, you know, I'll just read a, a couple lines as as ag, ag production units become larger and more sophisticated, agribusiness result will also increase in complexity. This increased sophistication will require improved management skills for agribusiness managers. And you could, you could say, well, that was written in 88. It's applicable in 2022, um, 92. That hasn't really changed, right? You could, you know, farms are continuing to get larger. We're adding more complexity now. We don't have, we didn't have AI in, in 88. Or we, I think there was maybe even there, there was a question on AI, I believe, in there. But uh, if I looked at the those skills from 
from the Litzenberg and Schneider, but I think that was at such at the forefront. Did respondents even imagine where that would be in 2022? Probably, probably not. Um, but that just uh, that really struck that for, section really stuck uh, stuck out to me as well, that's still relevant. Um, just some notes I jotted down from this morning. You know, what did we learn? Ag econ and agribusiness. Uh, Yulia just mentioned this. So not the only game in town anymore, right? So our traditional employer groups, not afraid to, to look across the campus at the College of Business and other, other programs for, for, those, for those needs. Um, communication still important. Work ethic still important. That degree, uh, is that just a ticket in the door? And then we'll see what else, what other things will differentiate that applicant or that early career professional from, from others. Um, and then co-curricular opportunities to practice skills. Uh, um, at the University of Saskatchewan, we're developing a, a co-curricular um, resume, if you will. So can, can students actually say that they've participated in NAMA or an Ag Biz Club or something else to, um, that employers can see and actually uh, it comes comes across on a, on a transcript that yes, you did this and somebody has signed off on that. Um, so kind of getting into where, where I'm going in this is what does all of this mean for how we teach agribusiness across North America, across other, other geographies where, where this is a, a, key, um, a key sector. Um, and and how, we, how I kind of see this is we can think of this as our traditional clients, our traditional learners, uh, degree seeking students came from a, a farm or a rural background who wanna work in a farm or rural setting, working with farmers in either a lending setting, a, a crop consulting setting, input supply, what have you. Uh, so we have those traditional clients of that degree seeking students plus those firms, right? Um, and then we also, as we, we just heard from Yulia, um, have these non-traditional client groups of that upskill, reskill. Maybe they've had a degree, uh, maybe they finished a degree five years ago, 10 years ago. There was some shift in their, uh, in their environment. They want to uh, gain some more skills. Maybe they want to um, uh, seek a promotion and they see that the, the people that have been promoted have had um, a particular set of skills that have enabled them to, um, to win that promotion. Could be a variety of reasons, right? Um, uh, but so they, there may be a career change. Um, also, it, it may just be like, uh, uh, I think it was Aaron or, or the industry speaker mentioned this of, uh, you know, for, for some other programming, you know, they may just say, we will, we don't, as long as you can open the computer and get it to work, we, we don't care that much. If we really cared, we'll, we'll send you to an orientation, we'll send you to a class to, to, uh, to have that. And that was, uh, you know, that might be a, another way to, to just, we'll ensure that you've had this by making you take this orientation on a, a program. So are, 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 are the markets that we serve, are they gonna be the same in this, in this um, micro-credential world, right? Um, here what I have is uh, uh, some, some words from Jay no Noel and, and Kanani uh, in a paper that was published in, in 2013. And I see this as uh, kind of an idea and not so much a, a criticism of our, of our profession, but just a call that, you know, we teach marketing and we teach the, the marketing proposition to understand your customer and figure out what, how do we respond to that? You know, when we teach students that are gonna go out and, and be marketers, we, we try we teach them that think about what the customer needs are and how can that firm respond to those needs, right? So in this, in this words from, from Noel, um, research points out that a successful alignment of higher education with workforce needs can be reached based on careful action 
by institutions that embed skills and attributes within uh, programs. So because these, these needs may change, are we actually be practicing that idea of, of marketing of how have the needs changed? How should we respond to that, right? Um, and, and is a, uh, a 39 hour course the correct way to provide some, uh, that material for somebody that wants to upskill or reskill? We can, we can have a debate on that. I'm not saying that this is the only way, it's just uh, one approach, right? So the, this option that's uh, coming up in, in Canada is this idea of a micro-credential. So what, how, how this is defined by the, by the government of Saskatchewan who uh, regulates how the, the University of Saskatchewan uh, operate. So my, they define that as a short programs that focus on specific knowledge, skills, and or competencies that address, address specific needs. So you can think of this, you know, you, you can think of these, these competencies as different components of a full course, right? So when you have a, a course on marketing, we might have different competencies within that in terms of market segmentation or data analysis or communication of results. And you can break those out into these more bite-sized chunks. And that is kind of, you know, a, an unbundling of that idea in this idea of a micro-credential. You maybe see where I'm going in a, in a minute. So here's an example at the University of Saskatchewan. This is, this, uh, this course is offered in the School of Environment and Sustainability, and it's called Foundations in Science Communication, um, offered by two faculty members within that within that school. Uh, I'll just show, give you, give you the highlights here. The, this, this program or this course is only five weeks long, 10 to 15 hours a week. And that's kind of that, that time chunk that uh, uh, these micro-credentials are kind of falling in. At. And, and that's not just program time, it's programming plus the time this, the learner will be working on that material. So about 50 hours of notional time for the learner. So that might be 20 hours of material that's developed by the faculty member, 15 hours of material uh, that's developed by the faculty member. And then, you know, 25, 30 hours of actually working on that uh, out of material time. And that kind of jives with what we're, we, the rule of thumb in, in, a, in, a, in a course, right? For every hour that a student is in the classroom, we think they should be spending two to three hours outside of that, working on problem sets, studying and so on. So 10 to 15 hours of, of material, 30 hours outside, we end up at about 45 hours of, of that. 10 four group, session, four group sessions, do the homework. If you do, if you do all of that, you get a, a badge, a certificate, what, what have you. Uh, outside of, yep. I would, yeah. That's how it, it's not like 10 to 15 hours in class per week plus another 30 on your own per week. Correct. Thanks for that clarification. It would be, that would be total. And then, yeah, a third of that would roughly would be watch these videos, so on and so forth, right? Or read this material. Yeah, yeah. Um, another example from, from our colleagues, uh, my colleagues at the University of Regina. Here's one on business communications. And this is kind of a, a way to kind of, again, structure that. What is a, if we break this down, uh, what is, so this is uh, 14 hours per badge times three to get to a credential. So you can have three of these badges, again, thinking about how to break, how to unbundle a course, almost, if you will, or to, if you, you know, we teach marketing or we teach communications in a range of courses, right? Can we put that together to actually show that the student actually did well or did that material in, in, that, um, in that particular area. Um, at the University of Toronto, uh, digital marketing strategy, 15 hours 
and they're maybe because they're the University of Toronto, they're they're allowed to charge five hundred and fifty nine dollars for that privilege. Um, um, so, you know, it, it's it's an interesting option, right? I'm again, I'm not saying that everybody should do this or run out and develop a micro credential. It's just this is coming up in in Canada uh, by you know the the government's approach to this uh, so a recent study from, uh, this was 2019, 76% of post-secondary institutions in Canada have already offered a micro-credential in, in, some, in some area. 64% uh, of employers see micro-credentials as demonstrating a commitment to lifelong learning. Uh, con contrast that with 59% of Canadian employers asked are not yet familiar with those micro-credentials. So it's, it's that is a is a bit of a puzzle to me, but that second part of the 64% of employers see that as that lifelong learning it goes back to what we heard from our industry colleague this morning on this idea of the degree as just a, a signal of work ethic. You made it through four years of, of a degree. Now what else, you know, how can you show that, right? So that can point to me that as more of a that that tenacity and, and grit aspect. Um, again, early days, but we're seeing, uh, you know, if you look at this uh, in Canada, uh, especially where, where I focus my my review on this, it's in this both essential and communication skills plus technical. You're seeing you're seeing you're seeing uh, departments are maybe uh, faculty uh, dependent on what they feel they can they can offer. Um, fees can vary depending on hours, institution, etc. Uh, there is a lot of public-private support for this. Federal government, provincial governments are behind this. Uh, there's a, there's a, a group called Palette Skills uh, that is, is working with industry to understand what our industry needs and how can they develop the uh, academic partners to provide some of that. So there's, there's some inertia behind here. Again, some, some caveats, uh, not a silver bullet, um, not saying everybody needs to go out and develop a micro-credential uh, and have these overlay or underlay all of their courses. Uh, just see this as, a, as an opportunity that it, it may work in certain instances, right? Um, still, this is not gonna replace any degrees that we're currently offering, right? But if you're, if you're changing careers and you wanna take a sales course or understand different sales techniques, maybe you can unbundle the, the, what's covered in sales in three badges and make that a credential that's easier for somebody who wants to reskill or upskill to take that as opposed to it's 15 weeks, here's, what, here's how you can take that, right? So again, it's just a, an idea of how do we, how do, we do that? Uh, does industry value this? Uh, if, you, if you've watched Field of Dreams as much as I have, you know, is, if we build this, will they come? Or is this not, right? Is this just uh, a flash in the pan? Uh, a fad that's coming through and it's going to blow out just as just as quick. So again, you know what what is this going to look like in 2030? That that survey from from Canada is it is it is it still going to last? Uh, uh, but again, you know that incentives matter. Is a discussion that Aaron had in in Portland. Uh, if we're developing these fees and you want faculty to do this, where does that money go? Can that can that supplement summer salary? Can that supplement? Um, uh, research budget, travel budget, what have you know? So if that, say, say Aaron could charge four hundred dollars for one of his courses that he develops as a micro credential. Where does it? Who gets that four hundred dollars? How much of that share goes to the college, to the department, to Aaron? Again, if we're going to think like economists and we respond to incentives, I'll do this if there's some some value in it, right? So. That was it for me. Um, again, we'll, we'll, all right. Just a quick question. So are most of the Canadian ones online or in person or is there a mix? The ones I've seen, most of them have been online. Um, there may be, you, you probably could offer that like in a, in a one week compressed, you know, if you if you have that over a, a holiday week break, we have a couple of week breaks in, um, in Canada. So that might. Know if you did like an evening thing where yeah. people live locally and they come in so many hours a week. But yeah. no. Okay. You, you, you maybe could do that. I, the ones I've seen have mostly been online. But yeah, certainly if, especially maybe if you're in Toronto or Vancouver or Calgary where you have a, 
a broader set of people that may need that pulling from a broader population it might work but all right and uh i'll close with that and then we'll i'll hand it over i'll stop sharing so nathan can start sharing and uh we'll go from there thanks eric can you hear me okay yep we got you nathan excellent thank you so much and uh i can confirm a little bit about what you're saying there eric because we run some certificates coursework that is almost a micro credential of sorts because people can take it on a per class basis. So it's these small condensed courses that we teach to retool people who are out in the industry. Those run about $525 a course. Um, and then co combined, we have six segments that people can run through. And again, it's this retooling concept of being able to either retool into a different segment of the workforce or in some instances, it's some of these critical skills that we'll talk about today. Appreciated that you started with a quote from um, Litzenberg. I actually officed next to Litzenberg and he has had a lot of influence, not only on my career personally, but also on some of what I'm gonna talk about. And that is these critical skills that we bring into the classroom. I don't know about you, but for the majority of us, we did not likely have a class in uh, grad school on pedagogy. Maybe a few of you did, but for the most of us, we've learned how to inject via the um, industry at large some of these critical skills into the way that we teach, into the uh, pedagogy, but also into the programmatic activity. So the focus of uh, my time that we're going to be talking about today, let me set a little uh, stopwatch here for myself, is the application. So I, I really appreciated the data. I'm not gonna present much on the data today, but I'll talk, I'll give a, at least a nod to a, a large study that is done in this specific area on um, these critical skills necessary to move into this job domain. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the academic response to that. So what do we do with our own teaching? What do we do programmatically to respond to the industry's need for additional critical skills? So I'll tell you first, this is just a slide that I present to students. I do come from Texas a and I don't think I even introduced myself. My name's uh, Nathan Harness. I'm a professor at Texas A&M and I direct the financial planning program. We're a little bit unique in that we're similar to Ag Biz, but we are training students to go out and become certified financial planners. Where do they work? Here's the slide that shows you a multitude of different areas. They go from anywhere, names that you've heard of, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, et cetera, through to government and academic research, all the way through to the tech space. We send a decent amount into robo, um, fintech sorts of firms. The bulk of our students tend to go into um, that teal area that you see there. So these would be areas with defined career paths um, to where they're working for small to regional size financial conglomerates giving financial advice. They're not managing, they're not acquiring new clients, they're managing clients that are already in the, in the door. So these critical skills, the ability to engage another human being beyond the technical becomes really, really important to us. The board that, <clears throat> right, that, that manages um, financial planning at large is called the Certified Financial Planner Board. And what they do is they do a study every five years where they ask the industry uh, approximately 90,000 certified financial planners, what should we be teaching people? So we're very fortunate from a domain standpoint that the industry responds to us every five years and they tell us exactly what we should be teaching from their perspective. They boil that down and uh, it represents about 72 topics. So across the degree plan, we try to make sure that we cover these 72 learning outcomes and, and more but from a, a domain, a job domain standpoint, um, that's the approximate uh, number of topics that we're trying to cover in response to the industry. What's been interesting, so I've been teaching about 16 years in this particular area and across multiple uh, colleges. So I've been in a college of business, human sciences and, and ag currently. Um, what's been interesting to me is to watch the evolution of in the financial domain, um, especially when working with the end client, this increased demand for what some would call soft skills, we prefer to call them critical skills, um, that, that increase in the demand for these. So you can see here uh, in the latest job domain that was uh, 2020, 
by the CFT board, they created this interpersonal cluster. This is the ability to train others to be able to coach, have an aspect of emotional intelligence, and to be able to do consultative type work. That, they said that that should represent a decent amount of what we're actually training them to do. The reality is in the classroom, historically, we focus very heavily on technical skills. So their ability to computationally solve you know, net present value of all sorts of different financial um, products all the way through to, you know, in the development of a holistic financial plan, the technical Monte Carlo aspects of, of uh, calculating the plan. Our focus is still there. Uh, however, we've been working hard to be able to integrate more of these critical skills um, into the curriculum along with the technical skills. So for the remainder of our time, what I'm going to talk about is how have we done that? What does that look like? Well, we started back with our mission. So this is the mission of our program as we reside inside um, agricultural economics. It's to empower future leaders and values-based holistic financial planning. The point of this, the focal point of this particular slide that I'd like to focus on is the instruction though. This is where we've spent the last probably five years going back and forth with our advisory board over and over again and saying, how do we do that better? So how do we do that while maintaining the technical skill integrity that you're saying they have to have in the market while simultaneously increasing sales and entrepreneurship and all of these other characteristics that the market is demanding? So what we've landed on instructionally is an acronym, EAR. We want to have the EAR of our students. How do we do that? We have the EAR of our students by making sure that our, uh, our coursework is experiential. So we brought a consultant in. The consultant actually now teaches inside of our program as well, which is fantastic. It's allowed us to really deepen um, what we're doing in this practical application. This is his formula. His formula is just simply this. Emotional intelligence equals to IQ, just your God-given ability, plus the knowledge that you gain. But you can see that one of the biggest pieces of the formulas is your experiences. So it's IQ plus knowledge times experiences equals to your EQ, your emotional intelligence. So we try to build into our, from a curricular standpoint, we try to build experience in there. We know they're going to get it when they go out into the job market, but we want to um, lessen the slope of that learning curve to the best of our ability. So you'll see how we're doing that here in just a minute. We also want um, our curriculum to be attainable. That is, we need to have accessible instruction. Um, with accessible instruction, that means multi-modality. So we're teaching in an online setting, but we're also teaching live and hybrid. And we're also doing chunk learning, as Eric was talking about. I forget the exact word that you use. We call it certificate, but we're chunking out some of this learning so that we can do it in subcomponents, whether it be with our current students or also with those who are out in the industry today. And then we want it to be relatable. I don't know about you, but some of the books that I teach out of are old and it's difficult at times to take content um, especially highly technical content and make it relatable to an 18 to 22 year old demographic. So we work hard to make sure that uh, from a pedagogical standpoint, the way that we are um, teaching is innovative and is representative of our students. So let me talk just for a second about the greatest obstacle that we have in doing what we want to do. It is developing scale in how we grow critical skills. That's what's so difficult for us. If I had 15 students and I could invest all my time in those 15, I could probably do this effectively. We have just in financial planning alone, just one subtract in Ag Eco, we have 150 students, not including our adult learners. That's a lot of students coming through at any one point in time for me to go in and inject all of these critical skills and spend one-on-one -on -one time with them. So we've worked hard, and, and I also, I mean, I see this as a collective, right? All of us together thinking collectively, we've worked hard, want to hear from others. How do you scale that so that you can effectively do this across a large number of people? Industry told us um, these are the areas that we really want to grow in. We want to be training, leadership, and followership, empathy, um, a student's ability to self-regulate, uh, teamwork, attention to detail, creativity, ability to be adaptive in the workplace, have ethical awareness, active listening, and communication. So these are all the, when we did our own internal survey, went out, talked to um, employers, this is what they want more of when it comes to critical skills. 
This doesn't really include much in the technical space. This is the critical skill aspects that we are attempting to grow inside the academy. So we came back, developed a team model. A team model is just a way to transformationally educate our students, but do it in a multifaceted setting. So the, the team is the acronym for teaching, experiencing, activating, and then ultimately mentoring. So let me walk through those really quickly. From a teaching perspective, one of the ways that we bring these critical skills to the surface is we use a lot of casework. Again, it's time intensive. We work together with the industry to do that though. So if I'm wanting to send people into financial planning, for example, I'm utilizing financial planners to develop a case together with. So when we develop our case for our final course, uh, financial planners sit down together with us and we develop a client, a very comprehensive client. We also try to take case material that overflows from course to course to course. That's difficult. It requires coordination across faculty and you know how that goes. Coordination across faculty is like herding cats. It's not a simple thing to do. However, we've worked pretty hard to say, can we have a case narrative that goes from at least one case that would run from their sophomore year through their senior year so that students can really dig into the non-technical, that emotionally driven aspects of a case. So we have students uh, not only in running a scenario together in a case, we have students uh, ask questions to clients. So that way it's not just being able to uh, pull out the technical de details found within a case, it's being able to ask uh, deeper levels of que uh, questions to the clients themselves. So we have actors that will play as the clients um, as they walk through this caps, uh, capstone. We also use software to do this. So luckily for us inside the industry, there is software that is using the technical to, um, to cue the emotional. One of these software packages is developed by a friend here in College Station, Texas called Holista Plan. And what it does is it takes, it reads in information uh, from an, a an AI, artificial intelligence, it reads in information from a client and it puts up cues of questions to the advisor, not back to the client but to the advisor on emotive conversation pieces that you could be having with your client. So we've utilized this technical software so that students can um, see a wider landscape of the types of questions that they should be asking to a client via software. And we started that with them their junior year. So now they're learning what types of questions they should be asking a client and it just builds their own knowledge base and their ability. We also do a professional and residence program. Um, we are raising funding for that right now, so we don't have that on a regular basis. But the professional residence is just bringing the industry into the classroom, right? It's expensive um, to bring somebody in residence for a week, week and a half, um, but we've been doing it. So it is possible to bring somebody in residence. They look through our curriculum, give us curricular feedback, and then they also do uh, mentorship together with our students. The experiencing is really the internship that I know a lot of your students are already doing. What do we do that's a little bit different from an internship perspective? Well, if we want to grow these critical skills, one of the things we want students to do is to be able to recognize what those critical skills are and define them. We were finding that in interviews, students were struggling to be able to utilize those skills or communicate those skills effectively. So they would go through this internship all summer long and they'd come back and I'd say, how was it? They'd say, fantastic. And I'd say, what did you do? Uh, and they would deer in the headlights. They'd be completely lost in explaining it to me. So what do we start requiring? That they journal that experience and they move beyond the technical. So we give them sort of some question prompts throughout their internships so that they could answer things about character, values, the application of knowledge, which is wisdom, nuanced communication techniques, things that they had observed during their time. And it gave them a vernacular that now extends on their resume and improve the way that they were um, the way that they were interviewing. I mean, vastly. We do externships as well. What does that mean? It's just students who go into firms and spend a day or two there. They're not getting paid. They're doing observation. We have them keep observation logs as they're doing that. So again, it in increases their ability to communicate these critical mm -hmm. skills. Next, uh, just the activating piece. What do we do? We want to put this into practice. So it's not just observation. It's not just learning its activation. How do we do that? We have a conference, it's actually coming up in October here on campus where we bring professionals on campus. We'll have about 200 uh, professionals coming from all over the state where students will give a presentation. We have to, because of the volume, we do 12 minute presentations where they present 
a plan and they are each assigned a mentor. That mentor provides them feedback, not necessarily heavily on the technical. It's more on the way that they communicated that, in, that packet of information, the plan or the segment of the plan that they were presenting. We also um, incorporate team-based learning into not only the classroom, but into our student org as well. So our student org, we built the org like it's a company. So it's a company where you're a lead planner, associate planner, and assistant planner. Everybody has a role and you're a member of a team. And that member of a team has a deliverable at the end of the semester. So we're really trying to build things around teams, knowing that they've got to be able to work and work through those aspects when they go out into the industry. Lastly, we do um, quite a bit of mentoring. Part of the way we do that uh, on a small scale is we have our a and ambassador program. And in that program, we have a... Um, we have a consultant who wrote a book called The 12 Keys to Professional Success, and that's all about these critical skills. So it's things like the power of words, influence, storytelling, lifelong learning, how to make first impressions. We're training that. So we train these 12 students throughout the semester, and then we put them in front of other students. So it's sort of train the trainer, right? Um, our vision is to take these students and train them. Uh, for example, a technique that we use is called LAVA. Lava is how to introduce yourself to another person in a way in which they'll never forget your name. So I could teach that to students over and over again, but I don't have time to do that. Instead, I train our 12 of our top students how to do that together with this consultant, and their job is to go train other students how to do that. So we're using students to train students some of these critical skills. We also take them on site visits. It's expensive. We found donors that have been more than happy to help pay for students to go and see the practice of our domain, our discipline done in person. So we found that that mentoring is huge. Uh, last thing is just that to being able to signal well. So the students can know how to do this well, right? If they can't signal that to employers, it doesn't really matter. It's not effective at that point in time. We didn't do our job. if The student doesn't know how to show the employer that they've done this well. So over the COVID era, I just built a website had a little bit of extra time and I built a website because I found myself probably just like you repeating myself all the time, telling students the same things over and over again. And I got tired of it. So I just developed a website that answers the majority of these questions on how do you signal? How do you do a better job of signaling the critical skills that I know that you have, but you're struggling to communicate? Now I send everyone there. I even have you know a canned, here's how you get there, email whenever they email me that shoots them over there. And I've built out sort of this pre-interview. This is just some screen grabs here of how do you have a resume? How do you even, um, so a passion statement, we consider that really important. How do you develop a passion statement that showcases your level of interest to specific to the employer, how to develop a cover letter, research companies, et cetera, et cetera. So we wanna make sure that they um, are able to signal those critical skills uh, when they're entering the job market, when they're interviewing for the job market. And now one of our biggest, most recent focuses is after they've left us. So we didn't want to stop there. So we started a, um, a former students group. And that former student group is now coming back and closing the loop for us. So we give awards to former students who are in the industry that are representing this well. And then they give back to the next generation by being mentors. And the circle is closed. And we keep that going over and over again. So that's the application and how we're doing that right now and how we're attempting at least to, oh, let me see if I can stop my screen, how we're attempting to um, respond to the industry's demand on us to maintain our technical proficiency while attempting to integrate in a scaled process the critical skills that we know are important to job success beyond just my knowledge that I have in whatever domain that I'm studying. All right. Well, thank you so much for that, Nathan. That was a great overview of, of the program that you uh, work in there at Texas A&M. And for now, I'll, I'll hand it over to Jason Bergtold, who agreed to serve as our discussant. Uh, and he can uh, take it away. You can go wherever you like. Uh, okay. so I'll, I'll go from here. But, but thank you. All, all really interesting. And, and I, I want more discussion than you. Um, I, I'll bring up a couple points maybe that will lead to discussion that I thought were really interesting. Um, in the first presentation by Ayulia, I, 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 it was really interesting uh, the connection 
And I still find it interesting, this huge connection with the need for the soft or critical skills. Uh, yeah, there's a big signal from industry as well saying, what do we need in the next 10 to 15 years? Well, we need data savvy, technology savvy graduates as well. And where do we find the balance? And so there's still this big change of we need to, in, we need the critical skills in our curriculum. Um, and uh, that's, and I think Nathan brought it up. How do we build it up? The question I had there was, do we have a pedagogy? Does it exist on how to actually teach? I'm even thinking of teaching a technical course that embeds these soft skills within it um, and approaches. Like, can we teach emotional intelligence within a um, econometrics course and fitting and, and how we approach problems um, or using a case study approach? Uh, and, and the micro credentials is really interesting. Kansas State just approved. What we're talking, and we do it through executive coach, um, executive training workshops. Um, we have online courses. I, I think most universities move that. We, we just approved micro credits, so you can actually get a quarter or half of a credit um, to add to your transcript. I mean, we, we have, and, and that was the whole point of those, is you could actually pay for that. So um, I, I just wanted, those are just some thoughts to hopefully generate discussion on because I, I think the big question here is, and Nathan, Nathan should have one great way to do it. I, I think all the presenters talked about how to do this. How do we get from the morning session soft skills and these critical skills into our classroom settings? Um, and, and there's a pedagogical question there as well um, on how do we do it effectively? What is the because um, I, I don't know from a pedagogy standpoint, I don't know if that's been fully addressed. I, I think there's ways to do it, but I, I don't know how, how do we merge that with the technical and skills that we need. Because I, 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 I really, uh, you, you mentioned that maybe we don't need to teach our graduates potentially to be as data or technologically savvy, but I would counter that with the fact that for some of these data and data analytics skills, companies are not set up yet to train in-house. So it's why for data analytics, that needs to come outside. The tech, those base skill sets need to be in place to be able to do the more advanced training that you take with a micro credit. And so, um, and some of that can be done um, outside, but there's still this kind of trade-off. So, Questions to the presenter discussion. And online. Roger, Mark, Kate. People we can see. <laughs> I guess I can just make a quick comment. Um, one uh, person I interviewed, he mentioned empathy, apathy, right? Oh, sorry, empathy, empathy. And uh, I was first very surprised to hear that, to be honest, uh, that being empathetic and just kind of understanding. Um, so I asked, why does that matter? And his interpretation was like, it helps you connect better with your customer, right? And so again, that kind of made me think, okay, how, how do I build this into my regular finance class, you know, how, how do I build that? And so one of my colleagues shared with me, again, just an example, what he does, um, he gets, he, he has an assignment for his students. Once a semester, they have to take a bus um, and that goes all around the town and record the observations of what they observe in the bus. Cause not how many of us actually take the bus and how many of us actually see, um, you know, how other people live and, so I think that kind of, again, that's a small example of that I started thinking, what can I do to start implementing small um, segments, yeah. I think that it's a great point because I think that, I think what we find, I would even argue in gen generation, generation Z, they want the empathic response too. And, um, mm -hmm. They want the empathy back and forth, and there's there's a movement in classrooms as well to be empathetic teaching. Um, 
meeting students sometimes where they're at with everything that's been going on and um, making sure we're aware of the needs of our students and the challenges they face rather than having to be kind of a complete separation. And so I can see that totally. And so part of it could be just modeling that in the classroom. Like there, there's been some evidence there that that's, that does pass off. Students notice and, and seeing that. Um, but yeah, how you bring that and teach that, I always found that it, it, it's a challenge because I thought about it in my classrooms and examples and stuff that I teach. And um, how do you do it? especially in our current environment. We bring in outside lectures on some of that as well. There's a great um, author. She's a professor. Her name's Brene Brown. Brown, yeah. Yes. She has one of the most watched TED Talks um, of all time, and it's called um, The Power of Vulnerability. She wrote a book called Daring Greatly. And in both of those, I use it in the consulting work that I do as well. Both of those are have been very impactful in that empathy and vulnerability space um, with our students to grow um, their understanding of the value of that in incorporation with you know, some of our core, one of our core values at the university's um, leadership. And we talk about that vulnerable leadership and the power of that. Um, if, if we're training people to be leaders, then they have to have some sense of empathy there as well. So we, talk, we start with followership, um, which is in that list that I gave earlier and how followership, strong followership leads to leadership. You've got to have one before the other. So we talk a little bit about that, but what we found is bringing outside expertise in has been helpful. And what I find is the industry is, is excited to come into our classroom. If we give them the opportunity and the complexity for me is keeping them on task. So you, you give them the opportunity and you give them a very specific task to say, can you share this specific thing with our students it is a game changer for them. And they love it. And, they, and they've done it in ways that I can't as effectively do it. So that's my two cents. Uh, I have two questions. Um, one to go to Eric uh, and one to Nathan. Uh, just from the administrative angle, Eric, uh, in universities, we have extension departments or continuous education department. In your uh, university, all these short courses or micro credential courses are being, uh, how to say, managed, or do you have a special unit that's dealing with these courses or development of these new courses and how you monitor quality assurance, validation of this? And also, a question to Nathan uh, uh, in this certificate of financial planning course, do you offer also specific uh, short courses? Um, uh, because in the whole certificate program, in, the, uh, in your program, you also have different micro-credential type uh, courses that uh, you can offer. You keep it as a unique product, a certificate program, or you also kind of broken down and you are offering different type of micro-credential courses. Sure, I'll, I'll respond first. Uh, great question. I think that's what a lot of the you know, it's, it's still new at, at the University of Saskatchewan. There's, uh, I think there'll be another course uh, leading into a micro-credential being developed uh, uh, this year, you know, so it's, it's early days. Um, we have a distance education unit at, at the university. Uh, we used to have a, we used to have kind of like a, you know, I, I think of University of Saskatchewan as a as a land grant in, in Canada, although it's, you know, it doesn't have the, the Morrill Act, uh, the Morrill Act didn't, didn't cross the 49th parallel. So, um, so but it, you know, we had this extension uh, component, but that's, that's gone away a little bit. And we're also on nine or 12 month appointments as faculty, so we don't have this. So there is that idea of when, when are we expected to do this and who is going to actually administer that. So I'm, I would expect or I suspect that distant, distance education may end up being the administrator of that once faculty develops it and they figure out how does, how does that money flow, then DEU will run it and they'll run the from registration on to here's the certificate or badge or whatever that goes from that. I think that will be 
where that kind of goes because that's where it kind of fits now within the, within my university. Nathan. Yeah, I think I, I heard the question um, fully, but we we have a little bit of both. So we have a certificate because the certificate ultimately does end in a designation, right? You're ultimately seeking a signal to clients. However, what we sell a little bit less of is this concept of micro-credentialing where you could take a one-off course and then that course becomes a badge for you. We The reason that we've struggled a little bit more with that is the signal is not as strong as the certificate itself. The certificate comes with, you know, our signature, a seal, something you want to put on your wall. Um, the micro course would be something that's more of a badge that would go on your LinkedIn profile. And we're just finding that the, the value of that for somebody to pay the cost of it is not as strong. Um, the content that we're putting on there, we work a little bit with, we have worked a, a small amount with extension, not much. Um, we should be doing a better job of working with them. We have a large extension. The content that they put out through the learning management system that they have is very shelf stable. They could develop something, put it out there, and it could run for six years with very little change. The content that we're putting out um, at this time has a shelf life of six months, a year max, because tax law is changing. The technical aspects of it are changing so rapidly. So now you got to come up with this model where you pay the faculty effectively for something that they've got to update regularly. And you need a cost point that's probably, when we did the math, um, given our market demand, we need to probably charge 500 a course um, to put us put us at market. So this gets complex. And back to your comment, Eric, of you know how do we get faculty to do this? How do we monetize it? And how do we have a revenue-centric model that incentivizes people to do this while gives giving uh, the administration their cut simultaneously? We were real time. I literally was struggling with this in an email before I hopped on here. This is something we struggle with every year. We've got a good, we've got a good relationship with um, the Center for Professional Development. It becomes the backbone, the delivery backbone for us. They they run the learning management system. When you think about it, you're teaching classes already with knowledge capital that clearly tuition bearing students are paying for. There's some of that that can be transferred into these sub courses as well. Now you can't give a tuition bearing student the exact same content that you would give somebody on the outside, at least in Texas, we can't do that. So you've got to shift it a bit and deliver it probably to at, at a graduate level or at a level of somebody who's already outside of the university. Um, it just gets a little, it's gotten a little difficult. It's gotten harder for us to do that than it has in the past. With that said, we probably generate, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand dollars off of that. So it's it's lucrative. Um, for faculty, we pay them a set rate um, to come in and, and do that and to teach those. And it depends on you know what the content is on, on teaching that, what the profit share is going to be. We, we pay them a set consulting fee rather than a, hey, X number of students come in here, you get a percentage of students. It's a set fee to be a content developer. One of the other areas that we're struggling with, and, and this, this is driven predominantly by me, I believe whenever you develop a set of lectures and even a, a style, a teaching style, a, um, even a syllabus, it is your ownership rather than the university's ownership of that product. Universities don't always find alignment with me and my thought processes on that. So we've had to work carefully to whenever content is developed, determine that teaching content when it goes out on a server, is it owned by the university or is it owned by the faculty member that delivered that content? Because that changes the payment mechanism. So that's our biggest logistic problem at the moment of determining how to make appropriate payment. But we've split, so long story short, yes, we do both of them. The certificate is in higher demand than the learning badges of the sub classes themselves because we're struggling the value proposition clarity on that. I'm just wondering how did you start uh, offering the small section programs? Like, because there are different demands that are out there. So whether you know whether you offer retail sales or marketing or IT courses, which one do we focus on? Because you cannot offer everything. 
Yeah. And how do you make sure that you have enough uh, students join the course you offer? This means like how sustainable of the class would be that you offer is every semester or a year out? And if you offer the class, if not many registers come in, so what, what would you do with that space? Yeah. And what you mentioned about uh, upskill or uh, just upskill or uh, beskill about those are maybe I said people are working right, yep. and that time is maybe they need more flexibility. This means they can offer you can offer in evening class or weekend classes. With that said, do you have any problem with uh, instructors who are willing to do that, who are willing to give the class at weekend or in the evening? Yeah. Were, were the folks online able to hear all that, uh, the, the question? So the, the question to, to paraphrase is, how would uh, a university uh, determine what subject matters to offer a, a course in a, that would, may go into a micro-credential and then um, how to deliver that uh, in a, uh, an in per, how to decide how that's gonna be delivered. Yeah, right? how, how, how frequent is it online, in person? Um, I'll answer that first part. I know, so we've, we've worked with, um, uh, at the university, we're, we're working with a company called Pallet Skills that I mentioned in, in my talk. And they're, they're kind of working with government and they're, they're, their mission is to kind of survey industry in, in the ag space to see where where are those gaps, you know, and we're, we're, they're kind of doing the market research of where is that demand in content specific areas and and then they're they're going to work with institutions to say there's a need for upskilling reskilling in this area. Would you like to develop something in that in that space and they're they're working with uh, the University of Saskatchewan and the rest. I think they, they're working with wealth. Uh, in the East, it, it could end up being as the conversation uh, earlier, you know, why couldn't somebody, why could this be, we're, you know, North America wide or, you know, Purdue could offer something, K-State, Saskatchewan, who, that is transferable across if it's general enough. Um, so that's some of the, that it, the, the gap analysis is almost industry led of, we would like something in this space. Could you offer that? The next question, I think you, you, you really hit it. It's the, you, we have to understand the, the client may be currently working, right? So we can't offer this at 2.30 in the afternoon, you know, for 90 minutes. Oh, you're not, why, why aren't people coming, right? The, you know, if it's upskilling, reskilling, it, they, that client group already has a job. So we, we, flexible delivery would seem to be the, the mode that would work there. So is it online? Is it compressed in a, in a weekend? Is it, an, is it so many nights for so many weeks? You know, it depends on where, how big your, your metro area is that you could pull from or how, how willing people are to drive for that. But I think that, I kind of think of this as a separate group from our degree seeking students this is some, this is another group and we have to offer this. If we're going to be successful in that, we have to think about where, when they, we have to kind of meet them where they are, right? And they can do this in the evening, uh, maybe online, maybe uh, asynchronously, they can find so many, so much time to do that. But maybe there's a fixed end date. You have to finish by this point because somebody has to mark this. Somebody has to do the quality assurance to see that the learner has actually done what they were supposed to do, right? You can't have this go on forever. And right. So I think that's kind of how we're going to think about this at, at Saskatchewan. And I may have missed one of those questions, but did I? So maybe just a form of specific, like what the class size would be. Oh, so yeah. So what's the, what's the minimum class size to make that viable? Uh, Good question. Nathan, do you have, uh, what, is, what is your uh, experience on that at, at Texas A&M and your, your kind of one-off courses or certificates? 
we'll run those asynchronous. So it helps a little bit, right? If you can run them asynchronous, meaning you're not running a cohort like you would students through a semester, it helps to be able to make it work at the beginning. So we ask them, we ask the market, what do you want to know about? Uh, there's a center for executive development that we have here as well that two or three companies pay for. Uh, it's just big energy companies come in and say, we want our executives trained in this way. So they told us, the market, what they want to know about, and then they, we just put together what they want to hear um, off of research. And we've got something somewhat similar. Marco Palma runs with um, human behavior. So he'll do a little bit with his lab, some of his human, human behavior stuff, and he runs a side course off of it. Um, that's for the industry to learn about that. They, I think they have a certificate on it now. The break even for us is about 20 running through a class. So if we can run 20 through a class, then we're going to break even on that class. If we run it asynchronous for a year, year and a half, that's super easy to get. We're typically turning a profit on the majority of our classes. Um, and we'll run several hundred through a class before we refresh the content and start over again with a, with a new um, content designer, a new person teaching a new set of content. So the, I think asynchronous solves that problem because now people can do nights and weekends, but it also means that your content has to be dynamic. So to just read off of slides and have you know a, a, a traditional lecture format that is um, without a Socratic interaction, we don't get as many people taking those courses. So we've worked really hard to develop a content structure that allows for a course designer while simultaneously having somebody that manages that human interaction, that regular back and forth so they feel like they're inside of a class. Our next move on that is to um, hybridize that to where we have, I know K-State does a decent amount of this, they'll have online modular learning, but then you have a residency portion where you come in for a week in the summer or something like that. That's a great way to do it to where you develop a cohort fa um, factor while simultaneously having this a modality that allows for um, asynchronous enrollment. Well, we're about done. Uh, we got two minutes. If somebody has a really quick question that could lead to a really quick answer, um, we could have that. If if not, we'll leave it. We'll leave that. Uh, that call. If anybody has one, we'll have a last chance. Uh, That's fine. See, yes. Thank you so much to to Yulia and and Nathan for for the for your information that you shared. Uh, thank you to Jason for uh, serving as a discussant, and thank you the attendees for your questions and your your comments in the in the discussion uh, portion. Thank you so much and hope you all have a great rest of your conference.